So let's pick up where we left off last time. We had been talking primarily about concurrency in Java. As I mentioned, that's not really the focus of this course. We're focusing here on parallel programming. So let's switch our focus to that. So we're going to start out by talking about some of the key concepts of parallel programming. And one of the key concepts is the idea of splitting, applying, and combining tasks in parallel. There's other ways to do parallel computing, but this is one of the ones that is very central and certainly what we're going to be focusing on primarily in this course in one way or another. So let's talk about this. So parallel programming, as we're going to use it, is a form of computing that performs three phases on either multiple processors or more likely these days, multiple processor cores. And the first phase is the splitting phase. And this is all about taking some initial task or some initial data set and then partitioning it into multiple subtasks. And this partitioning process may actually occur multiple times until we can split the original task or the original data set up into small enough units that can be processed concurrently and atomically in parallel. And the typical way of doing this is to split the subtasks evenly and efficiently until some type of threshold is met. And this also often re requires kind of recursively traversing through the data st structure, the data set, and splitting and splitting and splitting until you get things to kind of bite-sized atomic units that can then run sequentially, but all together. So the second phase is the apply phase, and this is all about running these independent subtasks in parallel. So once we split, 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 split up into these small atomic units, then we take those atomic units and we run them in parallel. And then, of course, the splitting and applying can actually take place concurrently as well. You don't have to wait till everything is completely split before you start to process. So we apply, we run things in parallel. And keep in mind that each subtask, each of these little things that I'm showing here with the little squiggly arrows and uh, thread symbols by them, those each run sequentially, but together they all run in parallel. So that's the way we're going to get parallel processing here. And then the final, third and final phase is to merge the sub-results from all the subtasks that have been running in parallel together into a so-called single reduced result. So we're going to kind of join things together. And we start by doing pairwise joining from each of the subtasks that have been running in parallel. And we join, 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 again, sort of like in a tree until we end up with one final reduced result. And this final reduced result can be a primitive, like a long or a string, or it could also be a collection. Uh, you could have an object like a string be the, what you're joining into. You could have it be a primitive, like a long. You could be at a collection like a list or an array or a map or a set and so on and so forth. And as we get into this in more detail, you'll see how that's well supported with more modern versions of Java, like Java streams and terminal operations. One of the key goals of parallel programming is to partition the original task and then all the subtasks that you're recursively splitting and splitting and splitting, and then combining the results of all the processing that takes place concurrently efficiently. And that's crucial to making this whole process work. You've got to be able to do the splitting and the combining efficiently. If you don't split and combine efficiently, then in some circumstances, you actually won't get a win from concurrency or parallelism at all. In fact, you can make things run slower. And we'll see some examples of that later. So you can therefore think of parallelism as an optimization of key performance characteristics. So you can think of parallelization as, as having as its primary objective optimizing something. And if you don't actually end up optimizing anything, then it probably wasn't worth using parallel processing. So let's talk about some of the things that you might want to optimize. So one thing, very common thing, is throughput. And throughput is essentially how many units of information or data or whatever you're calling these things that you're processing in parallel that a system can process within a given period of time. And of course, the intent is to make that improve. There's often a difference in practice between the maximum possible throughput and the actual achievable throughput. And uh, here's a fun little example. You can imagine, you can often think about throughput in terms of everyday phenomena like cars on a road or cars on an interstate. If you commute anywhere around Nashville these days during rush hour, you can appreciate this. So 
the, the theoretical max throughput would be to pack all the cars together, you know, inch, inches apart from each other onto the road and have them all drive sort of in a train. Obviously, there's problems with that, fender benders and other, other issues. So in practice, you don't usually get things packed up like that. You have to leave some space and there's all kinds of other things. Again, if you drive around Nashville, you know that if somebody pulls off to the side of the road, for whatever reason, that causes a slowdown. Whenever you come to places where uh, side roads intersect with the interstate, then there's slowdowns because people are merging and it's just a big cluster. Uh, but in practice, you know, moving away from cars as our metaphor, other sources of overhead like resource contention, sometimes people don't implement software as efficiently as they could, they might have too many locks, they might have unnecessary locks, they might use the wrong data structures, there can be inter external dependencies, there can be interference, there's all kinds of reasons why we don't always get the throughput that we would like to get, but the goal is to try to improve throughput. And once again, if you don't improve throughput with parallel processing, then either your algorithm doesn't lend itself to parallelism or you've done something wrong, or there's other things like the amount of data you were dealing with wasn't sufficiently large to get a win relative to the overhead of splitting and combining. Another goal is to be able to make the system more scalable. It's another dimension of performance, the ability to handle a growing amount of workload. That's a little different from throughput, although they, these are not unrelated to each other. The basic idea is as the amount of workload grows, you want to be able to auto scale your solution. You want to be able to auto scale your way of implementing the program to run in parallel. Now, when we think about scalability in the broader context of computing systems, modern computing systems, we often think about cloud computing and we think about auto scaling in cloud computing environments. And the basic idea there is if you have a workload that you want to make scalable, as more work is added to the queue or to the system, say as the number of customers goes up or the number of requests increase due to whatever reason, like it's your Amazon and it's the holiday season, everybody's buying stuff to ship for the holidays and so on and so forth you want to be able to burst out to a larger number of computers. That's typically what we think about in terms of scalability in the broader sense. Keep in mind, in this course, we are not focusing on cloud parallelism per se. We're focusing on multi-core parallelism, which will be within one, one CPU, one core, one computer. Now, of course, in practice, you could combine these things to good effect. You could have cloud computing environments where you can auto-scale and pay for what you need. If you need more, more processing power, you can expand to more computers. But in any given computer, you could also have multiple cores and you could also improve scalability that way as well. Clearly, if you only have a single thread of control, if you have a sequential program, then you're not going to be able to auto scale on a multi-core processor, although you could auto scale by having multiple replicas of single core programs. That's another way to get the, the speed up. And, and some people actually like to do that because it doesn't require them to learn the more advanced features of parallelism and concurrency and synchronization. Another thing we might want to optimize with respect to performance is latency, which is the delay between a user's action, like making a request, and a system's response to that action, like giving back some results to the request. So that's what we think about in terms of latency. And minimizing latency and variation of latency, which is sometimes called jitter, is very crucial for mission and safety critical real-time and embedded systems. So things like uh, controlling the temperature of a nuclear reactor or making sure that your pacemaker beats at a consistent rate or all kinds of other things you do when you're trying to control things like a driverless car or a drone or um, a defense system for incoming missiles or whatever. In those cases, the right answer delivered too late becomes the wrong answer. And so having things be very predictable is important. We're not going to focus very much on the real-time aspects in this class. In fact, some of the stuff that we're going to talk about is at odds with real-time because you're trying to improve average latency, average scalability, average throughput as opposed to making sure that the worst case doesn't happen. But it's important to be just aware of that concept in general. So that's the end of the overview of parallel programming concepts. Now, obviously, that was a high-level discussion. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty of this in just a second.